Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, today we're going to talk about uh, innovation and um, hopefully get you excited about uh, com coming up with your own innovative ideas. And um, what we're going to do is uh, I'm first going to uh, just give a bit of an overview about our research strategic plan and how innovation fits into it and uh, more broadly some of the um, intellectual property and uh, uh, development of uh, uh, devices, therapeutics, uh, software uh, is, is moving. Um, and it's really uh, quite terrific. Uh, we now have 15 startup companies that have been started by faculty members here uh, to move forward with their in inventions. And we have, uh, <clears throat> in the past year, reached four licensing agreements with uh, um, corporations uh, to actually develop uh, products that, that uh, we have uh, worked on here. So it's, it's really something new for us that really evolved from uh, uh, Kurt's vision uh, in getting uh, the Sheikh Zayed Institute and then uh, Peter Kim and Kalali Eskadanian and Tony Sandler's work in, in developing the Sheikh Zayed Institute. So um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview uh, and then uh, we're going to have three presentations um, uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, the type of work we're doing, one focusing on a device a second on a therapeutic, and a third on a um, uh, software uh, app related to education. Um, and then at the end, uh, Kalali will uh, talk about what supports we have available for you uh, in developing innovation. So that's the plan for this morning. So just to give you an idea of uh, where we are in terms of uh, funding of research at uh, uh, Children's, um, we have about $71 million a year of external funding. And if you add all of the uh, uh, monies that uh, Children's National contributes for the infrastructure of research, it comes out to just around $100 million. Um, so it's a little less than about 10% of our total uh, budget, which is $1.2 billion. And you can see that uh, uh, the majority of our uh, external funding uh, comes from the uh, NIH, uh, but that there are many other agencies that also provide this. And what's amazing is that um, uh, we submit uh, over 450 applications uh, for uh, funding from uh, uh, federal government, from foundations a year, and there are over 250 active principal investigators among our uh, faculty members, those that actually hold uh, grants. And then the pie chart just shows you the distribution uh, between our five uh, research centers, the um, Cancer Immunology, uh, the Center for Translational Science, Genetics, Neuroscience, and Sheikh Zayed. And fairly equal uh, distribution, um, uh, except that the uh, um, clinical and translational science is the largest and really holds uh, uh, the, all of the clinical research that we, that we do here. Um, th this is the Parthenon from my perspective in terms of uh, how you look at our relationship between uh, what we do clinically and what we do uh, research-wise. So uh, the, uh, the ceiling of our uh, house is the clinical enterprise. Uh, at the floor, are the, uh, the, the five research centers, uh, the, the disciplines that they have, uh, experimental therapeutics, biomedical engineering, genetics, neuroscience, and, and immunology. And then uh, we have a, a large number and an expanding number of institutes that connect those two. Institutes uh, focus uh, more narrowly on specific uh, diseases or the, uh, groups of uh, diseases and have both a clinical and a research component to it, frequently an educational component as well. And it's really been that architecture that I think has allowed uh, our uh, research enterprise to grow, given that when I came here in 1998, we had a total of $10 million 
in uh, research years. So we've grown tenfold uh, over the less than two decades. So if we look at the uh, research strategic plan and how that relates to innovation, the uh, first uh, um, goal of the strategic plan is to conduct translational research, uh, especially focusing on our marquee clinical services and incorporating genomic-based uh, precision medicine. And you can see uh, the type of disorders listed below that fall in this group and for which we've uh, extended uh, significantly our research enterprise. <clears throat> if you look at some of the innovation uh, work and intellectual property that we're doing on these, some examples include uh, the example that uh, Dr. Cruz is going to present uh, right after I finish talking about developing effective uh, cellular therapy uh, to avoid graft versus host uh, reaction and, and uh, uh, viral infections after uh, transplant. Um, we're working on enhancing our fetal imaging um, and in developing vaccines for cancers, just as examples. Um, in terms of clinical trials for the future, uh, the work uh, that Vittorio Gallo, our no, new uh, chief research officer, has done an epidermal growth factor holds the possibility of, uh, uh, of neural rehabilitation rather than just neural protection in uh, newborn infants. DBT15 is the um, compound, steroid-like compound developed by Eric Hoffman in our genetics uh, program that is now in phase uh, 2A testing. And uh, the startup company that's been developed from that uh, has been valued at $600 million with children have, having a 40% equity stake in that so that uh, there's a real possibility of that uh, ex expanding our research as we move into Walter Reed in the future. Economycin is a thrown away antibiotic uh, that uh, uh, Yang Lu, director of our cancer center, has found to be very uh, effective in uh, treating a number of leukemias and is doing research on that has developed a startup company around that. And then uh, my work focuses on adeno-associated viral gene therapy in urea cycle disorders, and we're starting a phase one trial um, this year. Um, some, um, excuse me, some other examples of technology transfer um, include the star robot that was, uh, that is developed by Peter Kim that uses artificial intelligence to do surgical anastomoses, uh, and uh, which we have recently licensed uh, to a, um, a company. Um, uh, the uh, HIFU, uh, which is the externally focused ultrasound under MRI guidance, which allows you in a non-invasive way uh, to uh, deal with uh, bone tumors, as an example. Um, an application to develop by uh, Marshall Summer to be able to diagnose genetic disease in the newborn period by using a smartphone to take pictures of baby's face. Preston Blue nanotechnology uh, that is a theranotic, that is that it both is a way of, of diagnosing uh, a, a tumor and then uh, providing therapy in terms of outlining where the tumor is and uh, guiding a, a, um, the, the missiles, if you will, of treatment uh, towards it. 3D vascular printing uh, is also being done, and then the minimally invasive defibrillator uh, that Dr. Brule is going to talk about um, during this uh, uh, presentation. So really, a, a heck of a lot has happened in the last few years here in terms of the development of new methodologies, uh, new uh, uh, devices, and uh, new software. Um, this really, just as pictures of the uh, digital uh, dysmorphology application I spoke of, uh, the 3D uh, printing, the star robot, uh, the fluorescent ultrasound uh, work, uh, the, the pacing. Uh, uh, so we have a, a wound application to look at how rapidly uh, that develops, out an algometer to measure um, uh, pain, and uh, uh, some additional robotic uh, work. So uh, really a very diverse group of, uh, of treatments that, uh, that we're very excited about. Uh, and this lead, leads us to uh, the Walter Reed campus. 
Uh, as you may know, Walter Reed is located about three miles from here up on uh, Georgia Avenue to the left, just below Silver Spring. It's about a 120-acre uh, area that about four years ago uh, was, was closed by the Army. And um, the upper portion was given to the um, D.C. government, uh, which is going to be building a new town there with uh, a shopping center and housing. And then uh, to the south, uh, the State Department has land that it's going to develop uh, embassies. And right in the middle, we have 12 acres of land, including uh, these, uh, these buildings here, uh, including the fabled Armed Forces Institute of Pathology building, which is 400,000 square feet of laboratory space. Just to put that in perspective, we currently have 130,000 square feet in all of our uh, research labs. So it really offers the opportunity of uh, transformational uh, change over the next uh, decade uh, in terms of our ability to do research, our ability to do innovation. This is just a picture of the Armed Forces Institute uh, uh, building, and we're having architects in now uh, in looking at the renovation and things like that. So I'm very excited about our opportunities uh, uh, for developing intellectual property and technology transfer and uh, hope that uh, many of you who are not already uh, involved in, in doing uh, this, when you have a bright idea, don't let it die in loneliness. Um, ha you know, uh, come and talk to some of us uh, about these issues. So with that, I would like to uh, um, turn it over to Charlie Bruhl, who will be uh, giving uh, the next part of our talk. Uh, thanks, Mark. I'm going to, and thanks everybody for coming. So over the next five to ten minutes, I'm going to give you uh, the past 20 years of our research. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is the, the challenges we face in trying to develop devices for children, whether it's cardiac devices or any devices. Um, you know, children aren't just small adults. And the specific problem that we're going to deal with today is the issue of pacemakers and defibrillators and how they're really just designed for adults and the limitations for their use in children, uh, including uh, obviously their size and their anatomy, frequent uh, concomitant presence of congenital heart disease, uh, they have vascular access issues, obviously their, their veins are smaller, and issues of, uh, of cosmesis. This here. So the standard approach for putting in pacemakers and defibrillators is either, either transvenous, if the vein is big enough, the lead goes through the vein and into the heart, and in a small baby like this, we might put a little extra slack in to allow growth, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, uh, or an open chest approach where the surgeon opens the chest and sews leads directly onto the heart and places the pacemaker uh, down in the belly. But all these devices are designed for adults, and uh, when you talk about the smallest of children, uh, those approaches aren't even applicable. We can't put a transvenous pacemaker in a baby this small. And there's other issues such, such as patients with complex congenital heart disease, such as this young lady here who has dextrocardia transposition and had a baffle and the baffle's now obstructed. You don't need to know the cardiac anatomy, but trust me, you can't get something through the vein into the heart in this type of anatomy. The other issue that we're all uh, faced with is the challenge of market size. And businesses sort of glaze over when you tell them the pediatric market size. And to develop a product costs hundreds of millions of dollars for a company. And when you tell them that maybe it, it might be used in a few hundred patients a year, or maybe even a few thousand, uh, it's hard to convince uh, stockholder-owned companies uh, that this is uh, worth their investment. And this uh, chart shows the U.S. market size for all pediatric uh, pacemakers in yellow and defibrillators in green, and most of those patients are uh, teenagers uh, old enough to get a standard system, and it's a very small minority of this already small number uh, is the infants and small children. So about 20 years ago, uh, there were uh, several case reports, including mine back in 2001, a single case of a patient who we designed 
a novel, what's called a subcutaneous ICD, um, where if you think about an external an AED, the patches go right on your side. And uh, so this is analogous to this. We put the lead just under the chest wall, right under the skin, and have the defibrillator in the belly, and it shocks them just like an AED would. Um, and interestingly, within the same month, two other authors uh, published case, case reports within the same month. So from three different countries, mine, um, uh, uh, an article from Germany, and an article from, uh, from Sweden. Sweden, of all places. <laughs> you got that. Okay. And now this has been reported for uh, over 100 children with uh, medium-term uh, results available. The other way that surgeons do it is through video ports, and the surgeons can place either pacing leads or defibrillator leads directly onto the surface of the heart through an open uh, videoscopic port approach. This is less invasive, at least, than, than a full sternotomy and opening the whole chest, so there's less morbidity uh, and faster recovery. And as you can see through the videoscope, uh, they have good visibility here. They're, they're uh, screwing a pacing lead onto the epicardial surface of the heart, and here they're sliding a defibrillator lead be, behind the heart. Again, you can see that the, the pericardium is open, and so they have a, a, a good visualization uh, through these ports, but it's still an open approach. And so what we've decided is try to go to the next step of making this even more minimally, minimally invasive and trying for a percutaneous approach. And our first publication came out in 2013, trying to uh, put a pacemaker in through, uh, through a needle, through a puncture, essentially. And you can see through this scope, you can see the needle uh, and the pacing lead going just under the pericardium and over the pericardium and just sliding in. And here, uh, it's screwed onto the left atrial appendage, and you can see atrial pacing and ventricular pacing of this uh, lead with, with good visualization so we can see where to screw the lead in and, more importantly, where not to screw the lead in, such as coronary arteries and things like that. We follow that up more recently with a publication within the past few months by um, Dr. Clark, who's one of our uh, senior fellows. We did most of this work along with, um, with Bill of Nath, a cardiac surgeon, and their team with Nobu Ishibashi, and com directly compared an open surgical approach. This is an animal model, obviously. Uh, you can see the pacing lead screwed in, uh, sewn on through an open <laughs> thoracotomy approach, and compared it to our minimally invasive puncture approach through a sheath. Um, and uh, Dr. Clark made this short 60-second uh, video, but you, what you see is the needle coming uh, punctured through. The needle gets put into the pericardial space, again, under, under direct visualization. A wire is inserted into the back of the pericardium, and then a sheath goes through that pericardium uh, over the wire, flies over it. Again, you can see where all of the critical structures are, where not to puncture. And then a defibrillator lead is threaded through that sheath and fixated to the epicardial surface of the heart. You can see the lungs there. And then the uh, sheath is removed. You see a very small hole in the pericardium. And that's essentially the, the end of the procedure. Um, not quite a one-minute procedure, but it's pretty short, and, and uh, our team has, has perfected this uh, pretty much in this infant animal model. Uh, it's, a, it's a good model for, for humans, similar size, heart shape, and uh, so we use that. This is a, what's called the fibrillation testing. We put the animal into ventricular fibrillation to make sure that the, the device can shock them out. Here uh, is a shock that was um, too low, and here's 20 joules shock, and you see them converting from ventricular fibrillation shock and back into sinus rhythm. And so that's, that's what we've been doing. Um, our next steps for the, for the upcoming year, uh, we just submitted an NIH uh, small business grant and formed a, a spin-off company. As Dr. Batshaw was talking about, we're one of those, I think you said 15 companies. Uh, we've, we've called ourselves Pericore. We don't have any money yet, but we have a name. <laughs> Um, and we're planning for the next few months uh, longer-term animal studies. Uh, we've done a few months, so we're planning longer-term studies. We have a meeting set up with the FDA to hear what they are going to need from us to get this to the next step, which is human-infant clinical trials, and then meeting with device companies to see how, uh, uh, what our exit strategy is. So as uh, a lot of work over 20 years, talked about in five to seven minutes, 
but the challenge is can we really develop a pediatric medical device uh, without being a multi-billion dollar company? What we need to do is make smaller, smarter wireless devices that we can take out and preferably be MRI safe. If you think about it, if you think about it, it's not moving, but 50 years ago, this is how you were watching TV. And nowadays, some of you are probably watching on your phones right now. Uh, look at the miniaturization of TVs over the past 50 years. This is an implantable defibrillator from 1990, and it was very large. And so you could imagine that, that 40 years later, which is just a few years from now, uh, we can develop an injectable device that's this small, and that, that's our aim. So thanks very much. I want to acknowledge lots of people that helped with this, and uh, I think at the end we'll take questions. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, I think just to speak uh, a moment about the idea of uh, uh, the startup uh, companies, as uh, Charlie was saying, uh, you can get from the NIH small business uh, grants if you have a company, even if it's a shell company, if you will. Uh, and those grants are funded at two to three times uh, the rate that a, a regular NIH uh, grant is. So if, if you have an idea, the possibility of getting funding is really quite high if you go after an SBIR or STTR grant from the NIH. We can provide some some help for uh, you in uh, presentation. We'll that will be by uh, Jeff Stotakis uh, from the uh, Department of Medical Education talking about uh, innovation uh, that uh, he and Mario Lini uh, have developed uh, in education and again formed the Hi, everybody. Um, some of you I've worked with, some of you I haven't, but I'm hoping that this discussion today leads us to be able to work together. It's, um, uh, I've been here four and a half years. I'm a non-clinician. I'm an engineer and uh, a cognitive scientist who've been who's been studying how people make decisions in high stakes, time pressure conditions for a long time. And it's been an interesting um, road and journey uh, that I've taken with uh, several of uh, the folks in this room than elsewhere. Um, I begin off the presentation with um, the patient who is uh, crashing, who is coding, uh, who is in respiratory distress, and um, having to innovate the patient. And I ask the question, is this where training should begin? Um, for many in this room, maybe first years, um, you don't have that pattern based of experience. For many of the more senior folks in here, you do. And so you know exactly what to do. Our mission here at Children's National is to uh, be able to make expertise more functional by defining it, and then being able to develop uh, high-performing individuals and teams through best practices in a digital environment. And we want to support the rapid acquisition of expertise through low and high fidelity, uh, you know, training products. Um, and so, uh, basically, I started asking myself the question: Why medical uh, e-learning? Um, basically, it's uh, Learning should be individualized. It should enhance the learner's interaction with others. And it should also transform the role of the teacher from a distributor of content to a facilitator of learning and assessor of competency. This seems to be sort of the growing trend. Um, what I'm trying to preface here is not to replace uh, in-classroom instruction um, or even live simulation, but to be able to do a blend uh, between the two. And so on this journey that we've been doing for the past four and a half years, uh, we want to transform uh, medical education to be both an in-person and digital apprenticeship by using this blended approach of in-classroom and online instruction. Um, what's been kind of shocking to me, actually, is that most pediatric organizations um, don't really focus on the online portion of training. They're individuals. They have a lot of simulation labs, but they haven't really defined what uh, pediatric, especially pediatric uh, medical education and learning is. Um, to date, how we're achieving this mission is we've actually built over 20 different online learning platforms that are clinician-centered. Um, here at Children's National, we're the only ones in the country that I know of that has a, a learning platform for residents, fellows, hospitalists, um, and even our QI safety initiatives. And we've been able to tie all of these digital ecosystems together uh, to provide different training experiences. Uh, we also create uh, this thing called uh, interactive multimedia instruction. I'm going to get to that in a moment across different medical disciplines. Um, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be able to work with cardiology, neurology, infectious disease 
uh, creating innovative uh, training products across different types of clinical skills and topics, uh, and we're going to continue to do that over the next several years. Um, and then we also validate these training products in multi-center research studies. So it's fascinating when we develop these digital patients or patient cases, being able to see how different clinicians across the country uh, respond to that digital patient, and it varies. Um, there is no set standard, and so our goal is to be able to create standards of performance across these digital products. Uh, we also have several manuscripts out uh, in academic medicine and other medical journals that are under review right now uh, based on our, uh, these multi-center studies and things like complex care issues and sepsis recognition. Um, right now, all of our learning platforms can be accessed on childrensnational.org uh, under the um, healthcare education uh, and research component, and you can actually see the list of them. Um, now, I talked about the four levels of interactive multimedia instruction. E-learning is a very squishy term. It really hasn't been defined in the literature. Uh, one of the things we started to do, we're actually beginning to write about, uh, is different levels. So when people think of e-learning, they often think of just training videos or maybe even a training module. Uh, when I first came here to Children's National four and a half years ago, uh, training was, uh, especially online training, was considered, um, you know, a bad word in a sense. It's something that people had to do. What we try to do is think of it in terms of something that they had to practice. So level one goes from passive, and, uh, uh, passive uh, participation all the way down to real-time participation. And we have platforms that can facilitate all four levels. Uh, specifically, we, we tend to focus on level three, level four with our virtual vignette players, and level four being our, our virtual live team uh, gaming environment in which people can up to, up to 200 different roles can congregate in this virtual environment all working on a patient case together. And the system captures, records, and tracks everything that you do. So we really can look at standards of performance across the board. Um, our process here at Children's is that we work uh, with the clinicians to be able to engineer and design a product, and then we test the effectiveness and then deploy to the world. And that's something that you don't see a lot of times in e-learning companies, regardless of the discipline, is that they typically hire a contractor who's been out of the game for maybe 10 or 20 years. But here at Children's, we get to work with the, you know, great clinicians with a lot of experience who are still continuing to practice to be able to develop the most advanced, latest uh, forms of training intervention. Um, but instead of me just talking, let me just show you what I'm talking about. And there may not be any sound. We're developing a company called IGL, or Interactive Global Learning, which will unite clinicians from across the world to be able to create uh, this type of e-learning. And the question we pose is, what if you could teach medicine in a, in a different way? And so what you're about to see is our You are working in the emergency room one evening in late August. You pick up the next chart and see that a 10-year-old African-American girl is here for evaluation of fever. The exam room is crowded, revealing a large family with both parents two grandparents, and a handful of other children present. Your patient is a tired appearing girl lying on the exam room bed. You begin taking the history and learn that the family returned from vacation two weeks ago. This is another one we did. I worked with Robin Marshall on this one. We took over 200 cases of kids with different murmurs and embedded them uh, into our, our virtual sim. And so they have to diagnose if it's normal or abnormal, and then they have to diagnose what type of murmur it is. This particular product was launched with... Here is an example of a patient with severe meningococcal sepsis, but in normal mental status. How do you feel, Zoe? Do you feel better now that you've gotten your medicine? Yes. When did you start feeling sick? This is our 3D baby. Rashes, respiratory distress, all kinds of subtle signs. In this activity, you will be asked to respond to a nurse's concern about one of your patients by working through an interactive case-based vignette exercise. And we're not just about presenting patient information, we're actually 
literally asking them, what would you do first, second, and third, and being able to capture those actions over time, and then asking them to repeat those steps later on. Um, here's an example of a fictional patient case in which they have to dive into information and then uh, diagnose the patient. We're able to actually capture that diagnosis. And it was fascinating in this particular study, we launched this with over 80 pediatric institutions nationwide to hear how people uh, diagnose that same patient. Um, and so we're sort of on this uh, journey, I didn't know it at the time, uh, to be able to transform the way in which doctors and nurses get training in this country. And one of the things I want to leave you with is we're doing this for the next generation. Certainly, we have a current generation here, but it's for that millennial generation who wants individualized learning. All of our platforms, as you see, are available on any device. Uh, we've sort of pioneered the bootstrapping technology for a learning management system along with our other types of learning platforms. And so that was the end of my presentation. So uh, I hope uh, you were energized uh, by um, these uh, presentations and perhaps said, well, I can do that, uh, and uh, because I, I hope you will. Now, what happens? So you have a good, an idea that you think is good, an invention in your, in your mind. Where do you go from there? Well, the first thing you do is to contact Greg Baker. Greg is the director of our Office of Technology Transfer, and he will walk you through doing a disclosure form. The disclosure form basically discloses what your invention is, what is the problem you're trying to solve, and how are you actually going to solve that, that problem. And then uh, from that point, we help you decide whether this is patentable. And if it's patentable, uh, we will pay to have a patent in your name for your intellectual property. Now, it's important to remember uh, that with U.S. laws, you can't have disclosed this, um, you've, uh, this finding, if you will, before you put your, your patent in. So uh, it's important, Greg and his office will be able to tell you what can you do in terms of abstracts, presenting at meetings, publishing, or not before you actually put your patent in. So now you put your patent in, and you have the patent, and now you want to license it. You have to remember that all of us, as employees of Children's National, anything that we invent here uh, actually is owned by Children's National. Even though the patent has our name on it, it's on behalf of Children's National. But that doesn't mean you get nothing out of it. So if you are, um, so what can you get for yourself uh, and your family, and what can you get to support your own research? Well, we uh, provide back to you uh, basically 50% of uh, all the license uh, royalties that come in uh, to the institution for your product. Half of it goes into your pocket, the other half goes into your uh, research to support your research for as long as you stay here. It's sort of a golden handcuffs type of thing. Uh, and then the, uh, the other 50% is divided up uh, between your, your division and Children's Research Institute and the hospital uh, and the uh, uh, technology transfer uh, department. Um, but you may also say, well, gee, you know, instead of licensing it uh, to uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, I want to develop my own company. Um, and we have policies for that, too. So we have a policy on intellectual property. We have a policy on startup companies. So we encourage uh, you. As I mentioned, we have 15 startup companies. You can uh, develop the startup company. The first reason you may develop it is to get one of these NIH uh, small business uh, grants, which have to have a company. The, the grant is given to the company, even if it's a shell that you're the CEO of. Uh, then if you move forward and you actually have a product and you want to move forward towards commercialization, uh, then we have to deal with potential issues of co conflict of interest uh, to make sure that we protect you and protect the institution and protect the children uh, that you are uh, trying your, your, your new invention on. So I would just uh, encourage all of you to, uh, to look for a problem that you want to solve if you haven't already. And your solution to the problem uh, represents your intellectual property and is something that you ought to consider 
whether you're a nurse or a doctor, whether you're a trainee or a faculty member. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, open it up for any questions about uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, uh, technology transfer, or specific questions for our colleagues about their uh, presentations. Dr. Teach, you always have uh, something interesting to say, so we'll we'll call on you. Uh, uh, Charlie, you mentioned something that kind of blew me away, which is the idea that you might inject one of these uh, defibrillators at, at some point. Uh, how, how would uh, how would that work? The mechanics seem a bit uh, uh, challenging. Yeah, they definitely are. So I, I think that uh, if we're, initially I might have been naive enough to think that I can do this on our own. Uh, but we really need to partner with one of the big manufacturers to do that. And if we develop the, the tools and techniques to uh, inject the lead, uh, then we're counting on the company to partner with to, uh, to develop a miniaturized device. And they, they continue to miniaturize them year after year, but it may be that we inject the lead and then connect it the back end to a small uh, device that sits under the, under the skin. Um, so we're, it, it's a, it would definitely have to be a, a partnership and not something that, uh, that we could develop here, although who knows, we've got some very smart engineers up there. Thanks. Robert, do you want to uh, give us uh, your case history of uh, uh, developing uh, your intellectual property? Well, that's a work in progress. <laughs> um, I've been working on a, uh, a device. Uh, an app, if you will, that uh, identifies the most common innocent murmur that is over-referred to cardiologists. And so that's for use by the primary care practitioner. And it, the problem was that we were seeing oodles and oodles of innocent murmurs in the clinic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and this is because we really don't have a good screening tool for murmurs outside of the stethoscope. And so that puts a lot of weight on the primary care practitioner. I do want to comment also, by the way, about the subjects. When we go around, for example, recording um, the hearts of our patients in clinic uh, uh, as part of the project with IRB approval and so forth, the reception is amazing. Even if it takes a little bit longer in the clinic visit, the patients, the parents are thrilled. And the kids, if they're old enough, are very excited to have been part of, of something bigger than just their visit. Um, and I've been really gratified by the response of patients here at Children's. Other comments or questions? I just wanted to make one, one comment. I think there's been a big... Um, emphasis in this presentation, I think appropriately so, on sort of uh, investigator-initiated uh, ideas. What is your idea for solving solving X? You know, I, I um, have a, a recently sort of gone through a PCORI experience, this patient-centered outcome research kind of experience, and um, I think that asking our families and our patients for their ideas uh, and their solutions to their problems is a, is a really interesting uh, uh, avenue uh, to actively pursue. and and think about, I mean, obviously these families and, and kids are living with, with these diseases and, you know, what are your solutions? What are your ideas? What could we design that would better fit for you in your life? Yeah, Lisa? Sure, I, I actually as I was sitting here listening to this broad range of topics and, and thinking about your overview, Mark, I, if I'd step even back further, like to 10,000 feet beyond the CTSA, and, and talk about what an exciting place this is to train and work because of the emphasis on innovation. And so it's not just sort of following paradigms that everybody accepts and we trod through things, but we're trying to push the envelope for child health and whether it's devices or whether it's really new therapies, the whole immunotherapy world obviously has just exploded, or whether it's medical education in a way that we can quantitate what we're doing, that we can be sure learners really are learning what's important. This is not happening 
in a lot of places in the country. And I know this through the CTSA network. And so when you call out to folks to set up, go oh, pay attention to your ideas and bring them forward, this is a place that can actually happen. And I think that's very exciting. Thank you. I, I think the um, other thing that this brings up is the whole issue of team science that, you know, historically when I was in training, the only way you got credit was if you were the only person who was doing the research and you were the first author. Uh, and, and now it's clear that, that science and development of uh, intellectual property is so complex that you need multidisciplinary teams to really work on it. And it, it's really, uh, and, and GW in terms of promotion has uh, started to recognize that team science is science and is something uh, worthy of uh, of uh, being given uh, credit for. And so also when you think about intellectual property, you don't even have to be the initiator of it. You can be part of the team that's developing it and uh, and doing it. And, and Dr. Barami actually was, was uh, one of the first uh, folks here who really helped uh, develop products and worked with companies to develop pro products that uh, made uh, health better for, for uh, newborns, for prematures. And I wonder, Rice, if, if you would share how you got into that and, and how that has uh, benefited uh, you in your career. As you mentioned, uh, as Charlie mentioned, a lot of products that we make, especially in newborn uh, population, is the orphan product. There are not that many patients that benefit from your innovation. And we actually, Ozzy Rivera, who is the head of biomedical engineering, and myself, nearly 25 years ago, sitting in cafeteria, having coffee together, we draw a, a schematic picture of a catheter that we use for VV ECMO now, and kind of took that idea to the lab to test it for recirculation, for how, how it supports the patient, on, uh, on on extracorporeal life support, uh, tested it on uh, newborn sized lambs who are equal to full term newborn. And uh, uh, what I wish I had attended this lecture and this presentation two decades ago, we actually were so excited that we, we, actually, we published that result in Critical Care Journal, in Pediatric Critical Care Journal. And the companies approached us to use our blueprint to make the catheter. So we, we lost the opportunity to get any kind of uh, patent or any, any, any kind of benefit from that. But at least I have a first author paper. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for coming today. I hope this has been uh, useful for you. Please use me as a resource also, so thank you.